Merrick, hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's so lovely to meet you. We've corresponded over the years and sort of known about each other and our work, but I think this is the first time that we've actually met in person. We have. A, it is indeed, and that's great. So, so nice to be here. Yeah, and you too. Thank you ever so much for giving me this time and for travelling to come and meet me. That's great. Most of, most of us watching this interview will have no idea what is involved in the life of an oceanographer. Could you give us a bit of an insight? Well, I think the, the first thing to say is um, I don't swim with whales and dolphins. Oh, most shame. ideas, people idea, people's <laughs> idea of oceanography is from watching things like Blue Planet with David Attenborough, or if you're of my generation, probably Jacques Cousteau, similar types of programmes 40 years ago. Um, I don't swim with whales and dolphins. I'm what's known as a physical oceanographer. That doesn't mean I work out. <laughs> it means I study the physics of the ocean. So I'm interested in things like temperatures and currents and waves and also the role of the oceans in climate change. So life as an oceanographer sounds exciting, but like most jobs, it's got a large boring element. I spend a lot of time sat in front of a computer looking at data, analysing data, looking at computer models and output from models to try and understand what's going on. I guess the more exciting bit is actually going to sea to make observations. Um, but even there, on most of the time these days, because you're using electronic instruments, you're sat in front of the computer and the instruments are making the measurements and you're just looking at the data and trying to understand it. But it's an interesting experience because you get to experience something of God's creation, uh, how immense it is. And also you get to uh, experience something of your colleagues because you're with them 24-7, for typically for a month, which is quite mm -hmm. unusual. Because most of the time we turn up in the office and go home at the end of the day. So you get to see sides of your colleagues that you wouldn't see otherwise. <laughs> So you've just touched on that, but can you give us a bit more, um, tell us a bit more about your experience at sea? I know you, your work has taken you to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, yeah. aboard research vessels. Um, what is it like being in such a vast expanse of sea for that length of time? I think the thing that struck me when I first went out in the middle of the Atlantic is just how big the ocean is and how puny we are as creatures mm -hmm. and that um, how... Um, I don't know what the right word is, how powerful the ocean is. So if you're stuck in a force 11 or 12 storm in the middle of the Atlantic, which I have been on a number of occasions, and you've got sort of 18 foot wave, 18 meter waves, which is 60 foot, which are big <laughs> waves, and you're bouncing around, you realize that actually the God's creation is so huge and so powerful and so awe-inspiring. It's quite, a, quite an eye-opener. But the other thing uh, it did, it reminded me of the story about Jesus and the disciples on the boat and Jesus calming the storm and the fact that even though it's powerful and immense, God is still in control and still has power over the natural forces of the world. Can you tell us about the work that you're doing around climate change at the right. moment? Okay, so uh, uh, we're interested in what the ocean is doing with uh, the heat that's being uh, generated by the extra CO2 in the atmosphere. So if you think about the oceans, they cover 71% of the planet's surface, but water has a huge heat capacity. That means it can hold a lot of heat. So the top three metres of the ocean hold as much heat as the entire atmosphere. And the oceans are four kilometres deep on average. So what's happening is that 93% of the excess heat that is being uh, produced by the extra CO2 in our atmosphere is actually going into the oceans. If we had no oceans, the planet would have warmed by several degrees. The oceans are acting as a buffer. Of course, the oceans are moving that heat around, so as well as taking it in, they can give it out. So, for example, in the North Atlantic, the reason we have a temperate winter climate is that the North Atlantic is giving up about a petawatt, uh, which is a lot of heat. It's the equivalent of 30,000 times the output of all the UK power stations, wow. and it's doing that continuously. So as the weather systems cross the Atlantic, they pick up the heat and moisture, mm -hmm. and that's when we have our temperate climate. So trying to understand whether that system is going to change or slow down is important. And then, of course, there's the effect on the oceans of climate change. Uh, the most obvious one is heating of the water, which is happening, and that has consequences like uh, coral bleaching. Corals are a complex uh, symbiotic system, and for some reason, which we don't fully understand, if they get too warm, they expel the symbionts, and then they die, and they become just white, because mm. it's the uh, plankton that are living in the corals that give them their colour. Um, corals are a really important part of our ecosystem, because they're about 2% of the surface of the planet, but they're 25% of the ocean biodiversity, so they're huge places of biodiversity. Then other consequences are things like uh, if you heat water, it expands, so sea level rise is happening just because we're heating the oceans. And that obviously affects uh, a lot of people. For example, in Bangladesh, uh, projected one metre sea level rise will displace 10 million people. 
that's a lot of um, environmental refugees. And I know there are some uh, Pacific Island communities that are already planning to evacuate. For a Pacific Island community, it's probably less of a problem because there's probably tens of thousands of them, but 10 million people displaced is a lot of people to mm. deal with, and the consequences of that are not good. Um, and then I guess the other thing to say is uh, we could get stronger hurricanes because uh, hurricanes draw their energy from the ocean. So if you've got more heat in the ocean, more energy, as the hurricanes pass over the ocean and, and draw energy from the ocean, they could become stronger. And there's some evidence that that might be happening. Mm. So there are all sorts of consequences. And often the consequences are for the poor people in the world, uh, not so much for us Westerners, yeah. but yeah. for people uh, living in places like Bangladesh or somewhere out in the Philippines when the hurricanes hit and so on. But some would say, you know, the ocean's so big. What, does it really matter what, what I do? What, what would you say to people watching this interview? What, what do you think are the key things that people can do to help in these areas? Okay, so uh, obviously cutting down your use of fossil fuels. So uh, I can talk about that in more detail, but I think a uh, point I wanted to make was, um, although we as a single person, or I as a single person, may not be making much of an impact, seven billion of us are making an impact. Mm -hmm. In fact, this uh, geological period is now being called the Anthropocene, Anthropos being Greek for human. So it's basically the first geological period in which human effects are discernible in the geological record. So we, all seven billion of us are having an effect. Some of us more than others, obviously those of us who use more fossil mm. fuel um, have a bigger effect. And obviously since the Industrial Revolution that's been an increasing problem. And obviously as the rest of the world industrialises to try and catch up with the West, it continues to be a problem. Yeah. So for us as Christians, where, where do we come in? You wrote a book recently with Rebecca Watson called Blue Planet, Blue God. Right. Why that title? Okay, so the title was chosen because it's got a number of resonances. Um, for example, uh, well, there's obviously the resonance with the Blue Planet programme on television. Mm. As it happened, it got published at the same time as Blue Planet 2 came out, which was, a, well, I don't know, either a God-given moment or a happy coincidence, <laughs> depending on your theology. Um, so that has one resonance. Um, Another resonance is the fact that um, creation, a lot of stuff that's been written about creation, care and environment has been written from uh, what I would call a green perspective um, and written largely with a terrestrial point of view. Mm. And as an oceanographer, I'm very aware that 71% of the planet is ocean. So yeah. therefore, I wanted to do something to link what the Bible says about the sea um, with what's going on in the world. And Blue God is sort of... Uh, there's been books with title like Green God. I just thought Blue God was playing off that in the sense of saying actually there's a lot of the earth that's something God's created that's not part of the terrestrial environment but very much part of the natural environment. And then of course Blue God has another resonance in the sense of um, you know if we're blue we're sad. And I can't help feeling that God is to some degree sad about our treatment of his creation and the things that we're doing to it mm. whether intentionally or unintentionally. Yeah, and these are things for all of us as Christians to be thinking about, yes. aren't they? Well, that's partly why we wrote the book. We wanted to give people a different perspective on some of these issues because I think a lot of us uh, don't have much to do with the sea, um, apart from maybe going down to the beach for our holidays. Mm. And yet the sea is a very important part of the whole ecosystem, the whole climate system, biodiversity, the whole uh, range of things it's important for. I mean, even at the simple level, the plankton in the ocean produce lots of oxygen, just like plants on land. So they're all important to us, our existence on this planet. When we look at the, the Bible, what are some of the surprising teachings in the Bible about the ocean? I think the thing that surprised Rebecca and I most when we started writing was we thought it would be fairly straightforward to write this book because we thought there can't be that much in the Bible about the ocean. I mean, the sort of standard view is the Hebrews weren't really that interested in the ocean. Mm. There wouldn't be much in it. But actually, when we started to write, it took us a lot longer to write the book as a result because we found we had to do a lot more research on the biblical aspects um, than we'd first thought. So I think um, some of the common misconceptions that exist, one common misconception is that the Bible uh, views the sea in negative terms. Well, mm. I don't think that's true. I think if you read carefully, you see that uh, the Bible is like, quite positive about the sea in many aspects. Um, so if you read the beginning of Genesis, for example, God creates or separates the waters from the land and calls it good. The sea creatures are, are there to multiply and team and fill the oceans, that's good. So I think the Bible has a much more positive view of the sea than perhaps traditionally has been thought. So that was something that we felt came out of the book. Mm. Um, another thing that we felt was important that we uh, 
reading the book was this whole issue of intrinsic, the uh, instrumental value of sea creatures. You know, they aren't just there for our benefit, so we can fish and eat them. They're there because God created them, and they're value in them in their own right. And I'm thinking about the frolicking whales and things. Well, it's only in the recent, probably post Second World War, that we've had the technology to actually go out there and observe some of these things. Mm on the scale that we see in Blue Planet uh, type programs. And that, that's all been going on for centuries, millennia, yeah. uh, millions of years, that so this whole creation is part of what God made and is valuable in its own right, and we should treat it with respect. Mm. Yeah, so the oceans are infinitely precious and valued by, yeah. by God, and for all of us, we should be as concerned about the oceans as we are about the earth. Yeah. What I know you touched on it earlier with our use of fossil fuels. Are there any other key things that you would like people watching this right. interview to to do? How can they what responses? Yeah, can I'll they say, do? say a couple of things that I always say when I give talks, which is uh, being rather simple-minded in some respects. I like to go back to basics, and to me, the basics are Jesus' two commands: love God and love your neighbour. So uh, if we're not looking after God's planet, it says the earth is the Lord, it's his planet. If mm. we're not looking after his planet, we're not really loving God. I think Christopher Wright says something along the lines of uh, trashing someone's property is incompatible with any, with any claim to love them. And, you know, we're trashing God's world. And if we as Christians love God, we need to do something about that. And the second one is love your neighbour. Well, in a global context, many of our neighbours, particularly the poorer ones, will suffer as a result, particularly because of us as Westerners. Uh, who are major, major users of fossil fuel, although other countries are catching up on that, though. but um, traditionally that's where that's been done. So we need to think carefully about our attitudes as individuals, about how we behave, how we are, how we love our neighbours around the planet. In practical terms, I think uh, the key thing to me, practically, is that you do something rather than nothing. I think a lot of people look at the climate change problem and say it's all too difficult. It's some, you know, government needs to do something or big corporation needs to do something. My view is I'd rather be part of the solution than part of the problem. So, you know, cutting down on the use of your car, um, eating less meat, um, walking and cycling. Um, there's lots of things you can do. Um, uh, I, I could give you a whole list. I think the key thing is do something rather than nothing, and that will vary on your circumstances. So, you know, what one person might do might not be what another person. So, if you're a vegetarian, cutting down on meat is obviously not going to be particularly <laughs> a good thing to do. But not using your car as much may be the right thing to do for you. Um, you know, there may be situations in which you need a car. Uh, you know, we have an aged uh, parent um, that we trans we transport around. It'd be difficult to look after them without a car. Mm. Although, personally, we we could probably manage without a car, but difficult in looking after an aged parent who's in her 90s. Yeah, so there's yeah. decisions that you have to make on a personal level depending on your circumstance but the thing to do is do something. Mm -hmm. Cut your use of fossil fuels, however that might be, whatever works in your circumstance. It's better to start with small and do something and then you can do more as you graduate. I mean a friend of mine did something like that with cutting out plastics. She started out with the simple things and now she's almost completely plastic free. It's taken her a couple of years, maybe longer, I'm not sure, to get to that point. And the same with fossil fuel type use, things that contribute to CO2 in the atmosphere. We can start with small things and work towards it. But if we don't start, nothing will change. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. As we finish this interview, what what would you like people to take away as a result of having read the chapter and watched our conversation? I think just to remember that the oceans are an integral part of God's creation and the sea creatures in the oceans are an important part of his creation. Mm -hmm. He seems to take pleasure in them. If you read Psalm 104 or the end of Job 38 to 41, chapter 38 to 41, God seems to take pleasure in his creation irrespective of us as human beings and I think we should take pleasure in God's creation, but we should also aim to preserve it and bless it and care for it, like he does. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Merrick, thank you so much for thank meeting you. with me again. Really nice to meet you after all this time. Great to meet you too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. My pleasure.